We have an award for second year medical students that we um, give out annually called the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame Award for medical students. And these uh, are the recipients from Memorial University. We've only been doing this for seven years, I had to count quickly, seven years so far. And all the recipients um, who were once in second year medical school, Desmond Wayland has uh, long since completed medical school and, and his residency, for example, you'll find these people, some of them still in Newfoundland, some of them in various parts of the country, um, completing their residencies. Um, they are, they have been received, they've received this award, a lot of what they did and also for the how they're doing it. They're people who care about the community. Um, they care about more than just um, getting good marks in med school. And you're going to hear about, hear from one of them a little bit very, very soon. Um, so just another aspect of how we inspire generations. We do it, you know, at that very end of the career, but we're also looking at doing this more and more throughout the career. Their bios are also, by the way, on our website. All right, so that's my preamble from the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame. Really, um, I'm here now to turn it over to, uh, um, to Mun so that you'll be hearing very soon from our keynote lecture. And I'm so thrilled um, to let you know that today we have Dr. Dolores McKean joining us. She's the Vice Dean at the Faculty of Medicine. She's going to bring you um, welcoming words from Memorial University of Newfoundland. and. Uh, and also, um, I think, uh, share a tiny little bit of her journey as well that uh, will be interesting. Over to you, Dr. McKean. Thank you, Lisa, uh, for that uh, great introduction. Good morning, everybody. And I want to extend my warmest welcome uh, to everybody from the uh, for the, the 21st annual Discovery Day from uh, the Faculty of Medicine here at Memorial University. Um, for those of you um, joining us uh, virtually here today, thank you very much for taking your time. Um, to come and, and uh, hear about uh, careers um, and uh, all the good things that are is happening within the healthcare uh, system. Um, for those of you who may not know me, uh, my name, as I said, is Dolores McKean. I'm actually an anesthesiologist in my clinical role as a physician and as a medical educator. I'm uh, vice dean um, here at the Faculty of Medicine. I did all of my medical training, uh, undergraduate training, uh, medical school, and anesthesia training. Uh, here at Memorial University. I then went away to um, Halifax, Nova Scotia to do uh, some training there and I spent the majority of my career working in Nova Scotia and I'm very happy now to be returning uh, back home uh, to Newfoundland to my alma mater here at Memorial and the Faculty of Medicine um, to now give back and help educate uh, you know, our medical learners here in Newfoundland. Um, and just to give you some context, I actually spent the early part of my years uh, in Bayvert, Newfoundland. So I grew up uh, earlier part uh, in some remote uh, sort of a rural location. And uh, as I said, did all my medical training here at Memorial. So uh, with that, um, I would just want to say that Memorial University is very happy to partner with the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame to bring so many bright minds uh, together here today. And we really do have an engaging morning um, planned for you. So I hope you really enjoy it. Um, and because Discovery Day uh, is being presented virtually this year, we actually have 24 high schools that have um, joined up from across Newfoundland and Labrador. So we're very well represented across the province. And I want to extend a very warm welcome to everybody. And I think we have well over 100 students um, and teachers uh, that have joined us today. I just want to give you a little bit of background about the Faculty of Medicine here at Memorial. We are actually the only medical school here in the province. Um, and uh, we uh, really are the academic core of health research within the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. The uh, medical school, uh, sorry, within the, the Faculty of Medicine, we have a medical school which trains, uh, which is undergraduate uh, medical school training. We have a postgraduate uh, residency program, which is training for uh, family medicine and specialty um, training after medical school. And we also have a graduate program. So within those three areas, we have 320 medical students. We have over 275 postgraduate learners or residents doing um, uh, post-medical uh, training. And we have over 320 graduate students here who are doing um, all kinds of great health research. And uh, those uh, learners are from all uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, the majority of which are from 
uh, Newfoundland and Labrador and often from remote and rural locations. So it's wonderful to see that we have so many um, enthusiastic leaders online here because that's what uh, we're all about here today. We're all about learning. And we certainly know that doctors and other healthcare professions and healthcare researchers are constantly learning. And healthcare really is about constant change, constant renewal, um, and research discoveries and translating that into clinical care are always being made. Memorial University's medical school is uh, almost 55 years old, and we have graduated many doctors and many researchers since our medical school opened, and I am an example of one of those. Um, many grew up in small towns, just like you, and that's exactly my background. And many have returned to their hometowns to serve their communities, and that's exactly what I have done as well. So our Doctor of Medicine uh, medical curriculum places particular evidence on looking at community needs and really um, trying to fulfill uh, rural medicine learning um, and embedding that deeply in our curriculum. And our researchers also at the Faculty of Medicine are uh, really encouraged to focus on issues that are important to the people and to the communities that we serve. So I now I'm going to move on and I have the honor of introducing our next speaker and that is Mr. Uh, Drew, uh, Andrew's full name, Robart. Um, and as you can see on today's agenda, Drew is our 2021 recipient of the MD Financial Management Memorial University Faculty of Medicine Canadian Medical Hall of Fame awardee. And he, just to give you some background, completed his BSc in biomechan biomedical mechanical engineering at the University of New Brunswick. And there he graduated as an academic all Canadian in cross country running, um, two time national scholar in basketball, and was the valedictorian with first class distinction. And of course, he is now a doctor of medicine candidate in the class of 2023 uh, here at Memorial University. And Drew's interest in medical innovation was initially smart, sparked at UMB while he was designing an affordable 3D printed, myoelectrically controlled pediatric prosthetic hand. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Which went on uh, to win the Canadian Engineering Competition in Competitive Design. Drew really hopes to use his background in computer vision and artificial intelligence to continue to increase the efficiency and accessibility of healthcare in Canada. And so those are very laudable goals. Thank you, Drew. He is continuing to work um, on a bunch of research projects, well over nine, in the field of medical innovation. Um, and some of them are in clinical trials using um, uh, sort of intravenous or jugular venous pressure measurement devices. Um, he's doing some chart reviews that are comparing the severity of patient presentation before and after the COVID-19 pandemic. And he's also looking at mobile application developments uh, for medical education realms. So during the pandemic, Drew became the co-founder of Virtual Patient Navigator AI, which focuses on developing integrated solutions to help patients navigate the healthcare system, to increase healthcare accessibility, and to limit potential virus exposures by using artificial intelligence. And all of that sounds like really interesting work, and I'm really happy to hand it over uh, to Drew um, as he uh, gives us a little bit more information about um, the things that he's been involved in. So good morning and welcome, uh, Drew. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for um, the warm introductions. Thank you, Janice, uh, Lisa, uh, Jill, for recommending me to come speak. I'm incredibly honored and humbled uh, to speak with you today. I know that we're on a virtual platform and that poses its challenges, uh, but please feel free to message in the chat. I'm happy to talk about anything, happy to help. Um, so as, as uh, was mentioned uh, today, I'm gonna speak about Show Yourself. Um, and I'm one of the graduates uh, or MD candidates of the class of 2023. Here's some of the things I'm gonna talk about today. I'm going to start off with some questions to, to, um, for your curiosity. I'm going to introduce myself, um, talk about a concept called lollipop moments, showing up, passion and purpose, and then have a few takeaways. 
So the, the questions for discussion that I want to ask and uh, feel free to message in the chat your answers of these. Um, love to see engagement throughout the talk. Um, my first question is, what are you interested in or curious about? I think everyone comes from very diverse uh, backgrounds. Uh, I understand there's around 24, 25 schools across all of Newfoundland and Labrador here today. So everyone will have very different interests. Uh, so feel free to share that. Um, and that's how, that's how um, ideas are generated from brainstorming and sharing, sharing different ideas. Um, as well, have you ever had a moment where someone said or did something that made your life better? And, and did you tell them? And then return back to during the talk. And finally, has there ever been a time where you didn't show up or you didn't do your best and you wondered what if? And again, this is something that I'll come back to and feel free to message in the chat. So just a bit about me and a little fun fact. Uh, I'm from Renforth, New Brunswick, and one of my ancestors, my great, 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 great grandfather, I believe, um, Elijah Ross was on the Paris crew, uh, which was a group of people from uh, um, Canada in a small town. Um, and they ended up rowing and competing uh, in Paris and became the world champions. And it was a pretty cool story to hear. Um, so growing up, it was kind of a rite of passage. We always uh, had to row and um, yeah, so that's a little fun fact. As well, my grandfather, um, he passed away before I was born, but he was a peacekeeper for the United Nations and he was part of the um, peacekeeping corps that received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1988. Um, and that's something that uh, I hold dear and um, know that he would be proud uh, of what, what we're doing. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm from Renforth, New Brunswick. I was born in 1996. Um, and when I was born, I had a heart condition um, called Wolf Parkinson White Syndrome. And basically um, th what that means is I had extra electrical pathways in my heart. Um, and so where everyone has electrical pathways in their heart that control how fast it beats. I had extra ones and sometimes um, the electrical signal would go in a loop and that would cause my heart to beat extra fast, um, which could be dangerous if I was hit or something like that. Um, and so as you may suspect, this was um, kind of my initial exposure to medicine having um, been treated. Um, I did have a procedure that um, completely reversed this um, called a cardiac ablation. And yeah, that was where my interest in medicine first sparked. Um, I graduated from school uh, back home and then I went to University of New Brunswick. And so one thing I always had growing up was a father that as who is an engineer, he's an electrical engineer and always uh, was very interested in different innovations, designing things. Um, and just trying things out. And um, here was a project that we, a passion project that we worked on together and we built an ice boat um, that you could actually sail across the river. And it went actually quite fast and it went so fast that all uh, the bolts all fell out. And <laughs> that was another story. But uh, yeah, I think something that I, was really instilled in me from, from a young age was uh, do things that you're curious about. Um, and again, I'll talk about that a bit more as we go on. Um, next, uh, so one of my summers, I worked for the Canadian Coast Guard. And this was a really, really cool experience. And I highly recommend um, all of you to explore this opportunity. It's a summer student job. Um, and here we're able to drive um, as you can see on the boats on the left, um, they go quite fast. It's a really cool experience. And essentially you work as paramedics on the water, your first responder uh, in case anyone's in danger. Um, and from this experience, we also got to partake in some really cool um, training events. Um, on the right is one of the training events that went on um, where they had the search and rescue helicopters and divers and really quite, quite cool. Um, after that, I worked, um, 
at the Atlantic Clinic for Upper Limb Prosthetics. This was uh, at UMB, the Institute of Biomedical Engineering. And this is where I did a lot of my initial research and kind of the things that I was interested in within engineering. Um, so here we, we designed an affordable 3D printed myoelectrically controlled pediatric prosthetic hand. And I know that's a mouthful, um, but essentially what that means is we designed a prosthetic hand um, that uses the electrical signals in your muscles to um, move. You can essentially train it with um, an arm that's, that they have. Um, and for us, we were focusing on kids ages one to two and it was a training device. So uh, essentially what studies showed was that early, adopt early adoption leads to um, long-term implementation. And so what that transfers to is uh, imagine if someone was a 40 year old and they lost their limb in the workplace. Um, if that person received a prosthetic within the first year, they were 90% more likely to actually use the prosthetic throughout the rest of their life. However, if you waited five years, 10 years, they were only 10% likely to use that prosthetic. And it's because people learn to adapt uh, to live life without it. And so the issue for a lot of these people were that the prosthetics were incredibly expensive. Uh, some of the pediatric prosthetics cost over $20,000 and in terms of force, they were hardly able to lift up something like a phone and they were only able to open about 20 millimeters wide, which is about two centimeters. Um, and essentially we were able to design a prosthetic that could open five times as wide, apply five times the amount of force. And it actually looked like a human hand. Um, we were able to use 3D scanners to essentially scan the arm that the patient had if they did have. Um, and able to mirror it. And so then the prosthetic that they received was actually their arm, which was really quite unique and quite cool. And so for this, we actually entered into the Canadian engineering competition um, in innovative design. And this was something that was very, very lofty, very far-fetched in our minds that, you know, we weren't even sure if we were going to be accepted and, and we ended up being accepted. And then when we were there, we were really there with the goal of just having fun learning. And we really didn't have high expectations, but, but what we did was we showed up. Uh, I remember the first day there was like an orientation session at 8 a.m. Uh, for people that were really keen. And we went, but we showed up late. And, you know, we really didn't have high expectations. We thought at best we would come third. And then I remember like going throughout the course of the, the competition, there were other people that had designed their own 3D printers and coded it in their own uh, machine language. Um, someone had designed uh, these sponges that essentially were made of crushed up tires that could be used to clean up oil spills. And they had already received hundreds of thousands of dollars of funding from uh, large oil companies in Alberta. And so we, we were in a prototype stage. We didn't have a final project. It was very much a research project. And so we weren't expecting anything. Um, and then I just remember at the banquet, you know, we were hoping for third place and they announced uh, the McGill girls uh, won in third place and they had designed a, a dryer that essentially had no lint, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, and then second place was the group from McMaster that had designed a 3D printer themselves. And so we thought they were going to win. And so we were really kind of uh, surprised and didn't know who had came first and then they announced first place and it was University of New Brunswick. And I remember just looking at my, one of the guys on my team, Brody, and just shaking him. And I, we were all just completely taken back. Um, but I think the takeaway from that is, you know, just show up um, because you never know what, what can happen. And um, this, the times that I've been most successful were the times that I showed up and um, even when I didn't think I would be successful. Um, and so one thing that I wanted to talk about a bit is passion and purpose. Um, when I was at UMB, I worked with a lady named Karina and 
something that she shared with me that I found very, very profound and helpful throughout my life is to forget passion and purpose and pursue what you're curious about. Um, I think a lot of the times in our society, we, we um, make passion and purpose this big thing. You have to find what your true life meaning is. And I think it's much more simple than that. And it's more about what are you interested in and pursue what you're curious about. And I think that's the times that I've been most successful in my life. Okay. And so after this, I worked for a couple startup companies, uh, Soma Detect, and I did a startup program called Venture for Canada in Kingston, Ontario. And one thing that the startup ecosystem taught me was grit. Uh, working in startups is a very cool, fast-paced environment, but it's also very, very challenging um, and very hard work, long hours, and not necessarily the best pay. But I think the things that they were doing, I learned a lot and was able to have conversations with C-level um, executive CEOs every single day, which was pretty cool. And one of the companies I was working for, they were developing artificial intelligence, um, essentially using light scattering to detect particle sizes in, in liquids. Um, and they were using machine language to um, essentially um, make they were, sorry, they were using machine learning to essentially improve the accuracy of the device. And initially, this was de designed to detect particle sizes in blood, um, but it was actually uh, used for different liquids in this case. And then next, uh, so I've kind of had a various different backgrounds, as, as they mentioned, I, I took engineering. Um, and so I ended up working at a nuclear power plant for a bit, which I thought was really, really cool. Um, called Point Lepro, and I worked on a team, an emergent engineering team, where we had, um, essentially, if anything broke in the plant, we were on call, and uh, we would try to create a design that they could repair it emergently. Um, and yeah, here's just a picture of the nuclear plant that I worked at, as well as kind of what the reactor looks like. Um, yeah. And then now, so I started medical school in 2019, and that's where I still am. Um, and yes, I am a come from away. So I'm from New Brunswick originally. Um, but I would say that I'm an honorary Newfoundlander at this point, so my classmates have said. Um, and I, I truly have really enjoyed my time in Newfoundland so far. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is everyday leadership. Uh, there was a TED talk by Drew Dudley and he talks about lollipop moments. And this is another concept that I found very profound. And I think it's really shaped and changed the way that I see myself as a leader and others. And what he talks about, he was a orientation leader at Mount A school in New Brunswick. And um, there was a girl that was a new student and essentially she was very, very nervous to start. She came with her parents and essentially told her parents, you know, I don't think I can do this. I, I, I really want to go home. And her parents said, you know, let's just show up. Um, let's go the first day and you can decide then if you want to go or if you want to go home. And she showed up the first day and uh, Drew Dudley was one of the orientation leaders and he was being, he was goofing around and um, she had in her mind, she said, no, I'm going to go home. She was ready to go home. And he ends up doing this funny thing where he takes a lollipop and he gives it to the guy next to her. And he says, Hey, you need to give this to the girl next to you. Um, and he got real bright red and um, everyone kind of started laughing and he ended up giving her the lollipop reluctantly. Um, but in that moment, um, it, it truly made her feel like she was at home. Um, she said, um, I knew I, that I shouldn't quit. I knew that I was in the right place and I knew I was home. And so in the Ted talk, he talks about this story that he doesn't even remember. She had approached him four years later and said, you know, you've had a huge impact on my life. I was not going to continue school. I'm actually still dating the guy <laughs> that you made hand me that lollipop. Um, and a few years later, he got an invitation to their wedding. 
But the kicker is he doesn't remember that moment or that interaction at all. And I think that that's a really powerful thought. And I think that that's something that you should take away with you is that you've likely had a very profound impact on people in your life that you don't even know. And one of the questions I asked at the beginning was, has, has someone ever had a profound impact on your life and you didn't tell them? And so I think, um, I think it's really important to show gratitude in our everyday. And I think um, what we should really try to reframe our thought in um, towards is telling others when they do something that has a profound impact on their life. I think that's really, really important. Um, another thing is we're often our biggest critics. I think this story um, truly shows how much of an impact and how powerful we really are. Um, and so uh, keep that in mind. And so uh, as you are all aware, we have had the COVID-19 pandemic and that's posed its own challenges. Um, and so I, I commend you all for continuing through school and doing uh, school online, uh, however that looks. For me personally, having gone through a lot of schooling, this has by far been the most challenging schooling I've ever gone through. Uh, so I, I truly commend you all for, for doing what you're doing and, and even showing up today. I think it's pretty, pretty awesome. I would have loved to have something like this when I um, was in high school. And so a big message I want to show or have here is to show yourself. Every day looks different. And so every single day, your best might not be the exact same. And I think that's okay. And I think that's something that's become really evident during COVID for myself and for, for my peers. Um, and so I hope that, you know, you're easy on yourself and that, you know, every day you give all that you can um, and know that that's, that's enough. Um, and so a, a little bit of a funny picture, but life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. Um, when I worked for the Coast Guard, I actually got dropped off on one of the buoys. And um, yeah, <laughs> in this moment, I thought it was really funny, but I know that some people may not have found that funny. And so just to, just to remind yourself, you know, um, we're not in control of everything that happens in our lives, but how we react to it um, can really change and uh, shape the way our life uh, goes. And so I wanted to return back to the, uh, when I worked for the Coast Guard, um, just to mention that when I worked at the Coast Guard, um, this was actually a story of failure initially. Um, we had to write our licensing exam at the beginning. Um, and I had a lot going on at the time and actually failed originally, failed the test. And I remember going to see the instructor. I, I had failed by 0.5%. Um, you need an 80% to pass. And I went to the instructor and asked them to see my test to see where, what I got wrong. And I ended up finding a mistake in their corrections. And I actually ended up getting like an 84%. Um, but if I hadn't gone and I hadn't showed up, then I would have been let go. I wouldn't have had that job and I wouldn't have had all these really amazing experiences. And so I think it's really important, you know, just show up. Um, I can't say that enough. Um, yeah, and that, ag again, that was my prosthetic story. Um, and so one thing I really want to emphasize is that I think Newfoundland's a beautiful place. Coming from another province, I, I truly didn't know um, how beautiful Newfoundland was and, and Labrador as well. For one of my community placements, um, I was in Goose Bay, Labrador, and then also had the opportunity to go to Nain, Labrador. And as you can see in some of these pictures, I got to see some pretty cool things. On the left is uh, a solar eclipse, um, and you can actually see uh, the eclipse there in the photo. The next one I thought was kind of a funny picture, especially uh, where gas prices are very high now. Um, this was someone in Nain filling up their, their plane with, they had at least 50 gasoline tanks. Um, but that's something that, you know, you would only see in rural Newfoundland, likely. Um, and then on the right was Churchill Falls. I was fortunate enough to go and see Churchill Falls when the dam had been opened for one of the first times in many years. Um, and so some of the things that I'm currently working on, um, you know, we talked about 
um, some of the other work I'm doing, but one of the more recent projects is called uh, Med Simulabs. And this is essentially a platform where we help crowdsource and facilitate the exchange of simulation devices for medical education. Um, one of the things I found really challenging during COVID is um, when we initially started school, many of our upper year peers recommended that we mainly use the clinical skills tools that are in the school, um, but we weren't able to access those during COVID. Um, and so we ordered some of them to, to practice at home, but because of supply chain and shipping demands, we actually didn't get our ophthalmoscopes, which is this one in the middle that you look at the eye um, and otoscope for looking in the ear until the end of the summer. Um, so we weren't able to actually use it. And so part of this platform is to essentially facilitate um, those clinical skills tools that sometimes are, are inaccessible, that can be very costly. Um, and also to design new clinical skills tools to improve clinical assessment um, and facilitate um, innovation. So on the left, we, we recently uh, received funding from the Canadian Federation of Medical Students to purchase some upsurgeon devices, which are essentially these um, brain uh, surgical simulators um, that use augmented reality. And I think that's like a really fascinating area. And I think that that's something that we're gonna continue to innovate in that space and uh, improve education from a remote setting. As well, we have on the bottom, a laparoscopic surgery simulator. So that's, that's minimally invasive surgery. And then on the right, we actually designed a head model uh, that can simulate looking in someone's eyes and looking in their ears um, and also doing eye surgery, which, which I think is pretty cool. And as well, we, uh, Dolores mentioned in the introduction, uh, started a, a company called Virtual Patient Navigator AI, which essentially we designed uh, kind of, or designing uh, an application that patients can use to essentially um, collect a patient history and provide guidance as to where the best um, place is to go through, through triaging um, virtually um, and then having up-to-date times um, for the various services in the region. Um, so as I'm coming to a close in this talk there, I just wanted to retouch on the, the things that I mentioned um, I think, uh, you know, forget passion and purpose. I think that that's something that becomes um, like a very large, sometimes unreachable thought. Um, pursue what you're curious about. The times that I've been most successful, was, whether it was at the Canadian engineering competition or in medical school, were when I was doing things that I was genuinely curious about. Um, yeah, and, and in terms of lollipop moments, I think you all have a much larger impact than you know. And I think, take, take that to heart. I think, you know, um, the times that I've felt most supported um, were when people that I knew were of, uh, that were important people supported me. Um, and I didn't always say thank you, um, or I didn't always tell them that they had a huge impact on my life. And I think that that's important. Um, you know, when people do have a huge impact on your life, let them know. Um, and finally, show yourself. You can do whatever you put your mind to. Um, you just need to show up. Um, yeah, and so that, that's everything I had to speak about today. Uh, thank you for your time. Wow, thanks so much, Drew. That, uh, that was fantastic. You definitely have given um, the students a lot to think about. I, uh, yeah, I wrote down a few things as you were talking. Um, did you tell them? I think that's such a critical message. You know, it, it, if someone has done something well, for, good for you or had an impact, did you tell them that? And, uh, you know, that has to do with gratitude. It's fantastic. Curiosity mindset, stay curious. We have a whole stay curious concept and theme with Discovery Days. So right on the mark. You're absolutely right. It, uh, you can't say enough about how important it is to constantly keep looking and thinking. And I even like that you talked about grit, you know, it hasn't all been easy. You talk, talked about that, the time in your entrepreneurial world and, and grit, you know, is what it took to keep going. Thank you very much, Drew. We really, you're a busy guy. We really appreciate your time today. <laughs>